do. Let's try that. Um, so I'm going to record this session just because if anyone says something, we could possibly make a, make it available afterwards. I don't know, but well, I'll try that. Okay, guys, time to behave. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I imagine uh, uh, um, I might not put everything up as one single thing, but it depends a little bit also how long we go and so on. And <clears throat> if someone says something really bad and doesn't want me to include it in a, in a publication afterwards, just let me know if, if you show, show something embarrassing in the background while I'm recording this. Like my kids passing by in the background, but they're not here right now, so maybe not. Um, so, okay, uh, we, we put up some presentations during the week, or at least I did and Stefan did and James did, and James is not even here. Uh, he, has a, he has a youngling, so maybe he has some valid excuse. <clears throat> um, so uh, um, I imagine that we don't really want to, I imagine that the people who are all off camera and mute are not too interested to, <laughs> Stefan is icing, yes. <laughs> reading the chat as well. So Stefan is this uh, more secret guy. No, his name is his name is Icing, even if he doesn't spell it like that. Yeah, spelling is my So he is Icing in IRC and on Twitter like that. Uh, so yes, we, uh, we have these different presentations. So if you, if you have seen them, or if you haven't seen them, you can go to the wiki page that I you know, for this Curl Up 2021, and there are links, and some of them are very long, some of them are shorter. The, the, the longest one I made is the one, the state of Curl 2021. And of course, I could, because I just go on forever and blab about things. And I've tried to cover the same things I've covered in that presentations previous years. So it sort of ends up similar, but up with updated information, it's just a lot. <clears throat> So I've, I've put down some questions or ideas to talk about here in, in, the, in the wiki, but I, I hope that we were, would be a little bit more of uh, more regulars around this meeting, but they're not. So I don't know exactly how well we will cover these topics, but we can just dive in and just go through them anyway and see what we can learn and figure out. So I, I, for example, I'm, I mentioned, uh, what I'm often struggle about is people ask me about my to-do, what I wanna do next in curl. And I never have any good idea about what to do in curl uh, longer time than possibly what's in the pull requests and issue tracker right now. Do you have any thoughts what you wanna see or do in curl going forward? Well, I have some long-term ideas maybe. I recently thought we we might start transitioning the man pages from ROV to MDoc. It's, it's a newer tool. It has pretty more advantages compared to ROV because it was especially made for man pages. The downside is that it is a completely different language than ROV. It has some compatibility, but it would require a rewrite or at least conversion. But I haven't ticked into such conversion tools yet. Mm, yeah, I, I've thought about that too, and I think there are really pretty good conversion tools. I think, for example, Pandoc is uh, able to convert from NROF to like Markdown or something. Yeah, true. So, so I think it's actually possible to do a pretty good translation, even if I imagine that we still need to, you know, manually correct mistakes. But I think it's at least the the bulk part is probably possible to convert to other formats. So I agree that because the NROF format is really not that convenient in using and when, when writing documentation. An advantage of Mandoc is also that we can convert it to various formats, including HTML, so we don't know, so we no longer need profit. And we can even convert it to the man format, not the rough, but the legacy man page format used in the AT&T Unix systems in the 70s. And they are still compatible with, with every man reader. So even for older devices, which don't support MDoc, we still can export it nicely to those systems as well. Right. 
Yeah, but exactly, because we still want to have them as, as man pages, sort of when we sh ship releases and so on. But uh, but yeah, that would be that would be a good thing. I think I think we would benefit from having documentation that is slightly easier for people to actually edit and improve. Because nowadays, uh, I think some people will get a bit scared about the format of the MROF pages because it's it's a little bit weird and <laughs> and not straightforward. And you you know the only way to do it is pretty much by copy and paste from another page because and, and try to figure out how how you actually do it. That's basically how I do it anyway, because I basically don't know it either. So that would be a good thing, yes. Otherwise, I, I, um, my personal plan is to first, I'm, I'm going to try to get more the hyper port fixed because it's really incomplete still. So I'm mm -hmm. actually, um, that that's what I'm hoping to do rather soon. Um, oh, someone is sharing a screen here. <laughs> oh yeah, I see something. Do you want to show something or is this a mistake? Or both. <laughs> Oh, never mind. Uh, um, it looks like Mohammed is sharing this, but no, no, he stopped. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I want to make sure that we also, I want to make sure that we have our Rust uh, backends properly working. And I, I know that the Russell's one is also in, in need of some fixes. So that would be fun. And then I really want to get back to, not maybe not finish, but uh, make the HTTP3 backends work better because uh, I think HTTP3 is going to, the RFC is going to ship like any day now or, or if, and it has a great number because it's going to be RFC 9,000. Well, there are actually four of them, but one of them is going to be 9,000 even, <laughs> nice and aligned number. And uh, th that is actually the quick RFC because the, the HTTP3 one is a bit delayed, but anyway, it's going to be, going to start getting deployed for real. And since all browsers are now supporting HTTP 3 pretty much, it would be fun to have slightly better uh, implementation in curl. So we have a few known bugs remaining and we, we don't do multiplexing yet over uh, connections, for example, and so on. So there's things to fix there. And I want to get back to that. I tried to get someone to sponsor my work on that because I, it's still quite a lot of work. We'll see about that. <clears throat> Otherwise, I don't have any major things I wanted. I want to see ECH support, that it in encrypted client hello, that will encrypt the SNI part in TLS. Mm -hmm. But uh, Niall is working on that pretty good on, on his side. You know, he posts sometimes on the mailing list about his current status. So I think we might see work on that from his part w without me having to. So I'm going to try to see where he goes and, and uh, maybe if he needs help or anything, uh, join in and help then. W from my understanding, he needs, uh, he has a patched OpenSSL or something. So I, I'm not sure exactly what you need from t the TLS side that you don't get in, in normal TLS libraries. And of course that is a bit scary because that's usually a blocker for mm -hmm. proper adoption. Like for HTTP 3, when we need a, a quick API in the TLS library, and there's basically OpenSSL is way, way, way behind on that. Wasn't the, the general mechanism that you have another client hello behind the initial client hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I think, I think uh, in the client hello thing is basically you have a phony client hello that sort of um, with more or less a random host name in. And then you have some extension thing to say that which is the actual one, sort of. Yeah. And and then you provide a lot of keys, so you have. They also are is combined with the DNS uh, records that you're supposed to 
uh, put the, some crypto keys in DNS so that you can get it going immediately. So, uh, and, uh, and looking up uh, DNS resource records uh, is also a bit of a challenge since you can't do that with uh, normal libc functions. But pretty much there's no standard way to do that. And then, uh, so then we have to use a library for that. And yeah, CA, we have CA res support, but not everyone has that and should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a, certainly a lot of challenges to get ECH in, in there nicely as well. But it's fun with challenges too, right? <clears throat> yeah, I would have to look what, <clears throat> what it takes to implement that on the server side. Yeah, it's, it's really complicated. Mm -hmm. I tried to read up on, on the on the crypto parts, but it's uh, sort of a more or less got lost in, in the specifics. So yeah, it seemed, <laughs> and I think it only got more complicated when they, when the, you know, there was the encrypted SNI to begin with, the ESNI, and then that was complicated. And then they turned the, from the ESNI into the ECH, which became even more complicated because now it was the entire handshake sort of, instead of just the SNI. So, uh, yeah. And this is in general, easy to learn, hard to master. I once <laughs> read the RFC of it, the original from 1985, and I just saw, okay, it's, 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 not, it's not deprecated, but there are so many updated RFCs, like there was the, the RFC column where the RFCs are listed, which update these, this RFC, and there were like, I don't know, 20, 30, so <laughs> I was even asking on the, uh, <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the, on the IRC channel on DNS and people, and I asked if that's uh, sufficient or if that's sufficient and people, uh, if it's sufficient to read these two RFCs from 1985 and those people said, no, no, no. <laughs> it's like DNS improve, uh, um, got a lot more complicated over the years. Yes, yeah. And, and DNS is really one of those protocols that um, some of the extensions are really hideous. So sort of they sort of <laughs> abused some of the original protocol things to in implement extensions in a way that certainly wasn't intended from the beginning. So they invented an extension format that just basically abuses the original format. And, and but it works and then it just piled on with so much. But but I think actually <laughs> actually I think TLS is harder anyway. The TLS parts of, of the ECH is harder than the DNS parts because the DNS parts are pretty well understood by now, I think. Yeah, that's true. So, DNS requires lots of cryptography. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> anyway, well, I'm sure we will get back to that. I'm not sure, but I, I don't really know how, how the standard uh, is around ECH or I mean, uh, the situation around the specification for it. So I haven't really tracked that. I'm sure we learn about that going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about, uh, I'm going to skip the question about contributor merchandise because I'm, I'm thinking about doing some sort of handout this year with merchandise to, con to contributors, at least the top committers in the project. But since we're just this few, I'm just going to skip it, but um, I'll get back to that another day. So um, I also just wanted to bring up that we have a rather flaky CI situation. So we basically never have all builds in the CI green. Usually we have about three that turns red, more or less in every build. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do about that. I've, um, I'm, tr I'm thinking, I've, uh, I've tried to, previously I disabled a few of them that were more or less always red, but it seems like my, my effort was just, yeah, I, I switched off a few that was always red and now we have a few others that is almost always red. So I'm not sure exactly. It's really difficult to get those going. Those, they're mostly Windows builds. And yeah, annoying. The most annoying part I think is for, um, the occasional contributors, you know, the newcomers who submit a PR and says, here's a new little tiny change in the documentation. And then it says, three builds are red. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, they, and they, of course, have no idea what did they do to cause this. And 
and, but I don't know. I, I, I don't think there's any easy solutions to this. And I think um, we just have too much CI to be able to have them all green all the time, unfortunately, or maybe too much CI with too little manpower to actually fix all those things. Yeah, other, other projects have the same problem. Yeah, it's, it's a constant problem everywhere. I remember working for Mozilla where it was even much worse problem than this. So yes, it's, it's one of those problems that as soon as you go up with enough number of, of jobs, it's just really hard. And when we also, when we run test servers, so they have, you know, we have to use networks and we have machines that are fast and slow and things that are just going up and down and yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to put it in there in case someone had some bright ideas just to blur it out like that. I am. I also tried to, and I thought about it, but I haven't come to any good ideas how to identify what we should add in the CI. Since we have like a bazillion build combinations, so we can't test all build combinations in the CI, but we should test some of them, and we should test at least the most popular ones or the most sensible ones. So how do we identify which ones we don't test today we should test, or how do we identify that we don't just test the same things everywhere and miss out a few important things. That's also really hard. And um, measuring test coverage, we did that for a while, but that's also really, really crappy way to do that because test coverage then only uh, counts coverage for one single particular build. And we can't do test coverage for every build we do because that's slow. And yeah. So um, I think we're going to just continue the same way we've done before. We do it manually. We try to figure out, and, and particularly when people report bugs, when we can see, oh, this was never tested, so we can add a test for that, or you know, that test combo or build combo, we can add tests for that. Uh, I think the most important part is actually more to make sure that all pieces of the code have corresponding tests, cases, and tests. And we, we're not even there. So I think that's perhaps even more important. I've tried to push Patrick Monerat uh, into doing something about GSS and Kerberos for the test suite, but that's a, <laughs> that's a big job. Since we have a lot of GSS and Kerberos support in curl, but we have no tests for it. So I think that's a, that's a really uh, fragile situation. And someone, someone like him is submitting big patches to fix bugs, but we have no way to actually make sure that everything is still working the same way as it did. Just, you know, manual testing. Someone runs some manual tests against some external servers and says, it works for me. I don't like that, but yeah, that's where we are with some features. You must also have some luck sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. And usually uh, it's also sort of, we have to be practical and pragmatic. If nobody's working on it and nobody is actually willing to spend the time and effort to, to fix it, so then we just have to live with it. Then, then so be it, it will, we'll have to continue like this. I don't know what, what to do otherwise. <clears throat> uh, usually it, it also, somehow reflects the number of users because the more users we're having on some particular features, the more uh, emphasis on tests and correction, correct code we get. So th those niche areas, of course, get less attention and less testing. What's good or what's it's fun, I think, is when we're looking at security problems in curl, we still get security problems reported mostly in code that we actually do tests anyway, but apparently not good enough or security is really, really hard no matter what. So we're having three vulnerabilities pending for the next release. <laughs> Some of them really nasty too. Oh. So we were going to do some new record rewards in the bug bounty program. 
And I think that is fun. That's the fun part of it. The sad part is more the actual problems. <laughs> <laughs> were they easy to, to analyze? Uh, I would say two of them were uh, really easy and, and uh, shockingly silly. Um, one of them is over 20 years old. <laughs> and uh, uh, both the two the easy ones, they were, they were sort of, yes, when you see it in the code, you see it pretty much immediately, mm -hmm. which is also interesting that we haven't found them with fuzzing and code reviewing or anything. And the, and the third one that is actually the, the worst one, that is not easy to catch. It wasn't easy to analyze. It wasn't easy to understand. So it's basically taken us a week of back and forth to, to just understand exactly how it happens, what triggers it and what, and what's one of my toughest things I think with security is just to assess what's the worst possible outcome here. You know, okay, we have a, use after free what's the worst how can you exploit this use after free sort of what what's what's the impact of it or what's the worst possible impact and in this case it's actually uh, really really bad so there's actually a small chance of a remote code execution if you're sort of you know the planets are aligned and you have the wind in the right correction uh, direction and so on very very small risk i would say but there's a risk so I think that's going to be the new record reward amount for the bug bounty program. We have to spend our donated money anyway, right? So <laughs> well, I think the bug bounty program is a, is a very good idea. It gets people or to find something because many do uh, such vulnerability research as their main job. They, yeah, bug bounties are their main source of income and that's a pretty good idea to find. Yeah, it's a win-win situation, I guess. Yeah, I think so too. So uh, yes, even if I also understand those who sort of, it's a little bit weird that we're all volunteers in, a, in this project, but we're only paying someone and those who actually find a particular pine, sort kind of bugs. While we who are fixing things, we don't get the money. So I, I can sort of understand that objection to the bug bounty, uh, bug bounty program in general. But I, but I agree with you. I think it, this works good. I know that several of those who are actually trying to find problems in curl, they do this as a full-time gig. And when they do this as full-time work, they actually go to projects that might pay them because that's their full-time job, right? So they want money to get food on the table. So I, I think that's a good idea. And I think it works also. So that's fun. My, my sister is working at the Swiss Postal Service and they have, uh, uh, I think in the last year, made a public bug bounty program for and, and invited people to attack their servers. So it's not really related to a project, but really to a, to a, to a company you made that public. And I haven't heard that so often. I don't know how, if it's more common somewhere else or you, you might, someone might know more if other companies are doing it like this publicly, I mean, deploy, employing red teams is one thing, but uh, like inviting publicly uh, people to hack your servers, <clears throat> I haven't heard that so much. Uh, I think it's right, it's probably not that common that you invite people like that, right? But they're, they're I mean, paying for security problem, that's, that's uh, as a back bounty, that's at least rather common these days, at least by companies. I think it's still pretty rare among open source projects to still do it. So I think it's good for us that we can manage to do this. Definitely. Yeah, many open source projects also like the fund support, I believe. Um, right, and then I'm going to soon, I, I, I'm planning to get going on the annual user survey for 2021. And uh, so I wanted just to mention it here in case someone had some interesting ideas we should ask people this year. I usually try to ask questions, roughly the same questions as last year, mostly because it's really, really, really hard to assess people's opinions because you know we don't know who's answering compared to who's answered last year 
or it's such a self-selected bunch, you know, just a few hundred people randomly who wants to answer questions about curl. Uh, so it's, I think the most value is comparing to previous years, just because, you know, is it good, is it bad, is it better or worse? Whatever we ask, it's better to compare than to use absolute values. So, and also it's hard to come up with good questions to ask and <laughs> rather ask questions that we want the answers to and what should we do with the answers. Just asking questions is fun, but if we don't know what to do with the answers anyway, we rather we better not even ask. But I've usually put that up some at some time in, in, in May. So I'm I'm going to do that like in a in a week or two, I'm going to do get it going. And I wanted to bring up the uh, the um, question about version eight. If anyone has any fun opinions about version eight, I'm, my plan is to just one of these uh, versions going forward, just bump to version 8.0.0, just because I don't want to run into version 7.100. Yeah, I totally agree with you. 7.100 looks a bit weird, but another but um, problem I see with it is that we couldn't use major version increases anymore if we might want to break the ABI because there are many things in the curl API we could change. Like we could be, we could use the version eight to finally deprecate curl easy setup with, with, with some type safe functions. Yeah, yes, yeah, we could. But I mean, if we wanted to do that, we could, even if we go to version eight without doing it, we could always, if we at some point want to do that, we could go to version nine. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I mean it's, it's not gone just because we do yeah. that way. I'm I, I'm a bit hesitant to change the API like that anyway, mostly because I I know how people dislike changing API and yeah, API. True. So I think even if I think some of our uh, my IP, API choices or ways to use the API is a bit quirky and maybe not the ideal ones, I think it's still better to you know stick with what we have rather than change yeah, just because of that. So that's why I also think that's why we have these print functions and some of the other functions that are still in the API that are, I regret that we ever added them to the API, but they're there now. So we support them. And I think it's the so, sort of the work or the penalty to support them and keep them in the API. That's still better than I think than the backlash we will get if we remove them and add a new do the SO name bump. I, re I, I still remember the, the backlash we had the last time we did the SM name bump, which, which was in 2006. People were mighty upset then that we did it. And, and it was only a very, very tiny change in the API. What was it? We rem I, I deemed we should do it because I removed a few options that uh, were about you know, third party FTP transfers. Mm -hmm. You know, when you set up from the client, you connect to two servers and send data between those two servers, which you yeah. can do. You can do that in FTP, or you could do it in FTP back in the days. Um, curl could do it, and then I removed support for it because it was more or less uh, wasn't. It was. It's hard to, uh, for FTP. All the servers have pretty much disabled that ability, and uh, it was not tested good enough in curl, and it was mostly broken. So. I, and it really didn't, it was done in a very blocking way in curl too. So it didn't really mm. fit with the rest of the curl yeah. internal. So I, we either had to fix it and, and you know, remodel it completely or we had to yank it out. So I decided we would yank it out. And then I thought, well, someone who's using these options are going to be upset if we don't bump the SO name because we really broke the ABI. So we should bump the SO name. And then I had a lot of discussions with uh, users about that. And you know, Debian, they decided that I was completely wrong. So they uh, reverted the SO name bump in, in Debian. So they stuck to the old SO name for, I, I think, 15 years or so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they, they stuck at three, we went to four. So uh, Debian, yes, yeah. they kept number three since then. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see it. You can still see it when you install when you search for curl, libcurl in the repositories, you see libcurl three, libcurl four. Yes, so that's why they, so they forcibly went down to three because they thought I was wrong to do the bump and they should stick to three. 
I think they were wrong, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. And, <laughs> and, and then for some fun reason, they bumped to four because they think we changed the ABI when I think we didn't. <laughs> So, so eventually they caught up with us when they, and uh, I know that they bumped their version, their SL name when, uh, uh, you know, when they changed OpenSSL version. I don't remember exactly which bump in versioning, but, you know, we have one API calling curl called SSL context function, which is a callback to the application, which sends a pointer to, a context pointer into the SSL library is really yeah. horrible because it's really a TLS library specific, not the and way not we want by everyone. No, exactly, and, and not really, not at all the way we want to do it in curl to remain agnostic. But this sort of exposes that you're you have to know which TLS library you're working with. Mm. And OpenSSL actually changed some details in internals than between some versions, so an application would have different behaviors depending on which OpenSSL version it was built to use. Uh, I didn't quite get the exact details, but, but Debian thought that that was an IBA break. So they, mm. bumped, they bumped the number eventually. It was, this was just a few years ago. So they, they're now on number four, as we are. <laughs> So I wanted James Fuller to join here today so I could ask him more about the Docker images. Um, I'm thinking about ways how we can provide experimental curl builds better or binary builds for users who want to live on the edge. <clears throat> or rather, I would, I would like to be able to get more users to try out more experimental features because I think I've tried to you know, I introduced experimental features like two, three years ago. I don't remember. So some of the things we add to curl, we say, we say they're experimental. They're not enabled by default. You have to enable them in the build to just allow everyone to try them out and see if it works and we can change them before they go live and so on. But the, in reality, it means that nobody is using them because nobody's uh -huh. basically nobody's actually building curl themselves and using that day to day. So shipping experimental features that's mostly a way for us to be able to run them in the test suite for a while so nobody's actually verifying them or you know get it. we don't get any feedback does it actually work so having them experimental for a long time it doesn't do anything extra we can have them experimental for a few months it's the same as a year because it seems that we basically don't get any users using them anyway so that's why I've sort of started to think about how we can <clears throat> provide ways or something to get users to at least try out stuff easier. For example, HTTP3 support or hyper builds or Russell's builds or, you know, when I introduced HSTS and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, what I noticed is that, uh, uh, that Snap, the thing that Canonical is pushing a lot in the Linux world, that they offer some kind of ch several channels you can choose as a user. So I heard someone actually on the mailing list, there was recently someone who said, yeah, there's a code snap now. Uh, yes. Yeah. Maybe we could, I don't know, add a bleeding edge channel because many snaps have bleeding edge channels, but I'm not into it, but a lot. I just know that it exists and that's everything. But maybe yeah. that's looking into it. Right, that, that, that sort of that sums up my position. That you, I know that it exists, and it should probably be possible to do that. So the, that would be could be one way. So yeah, I, I haven't really um, figured out exactly how or what, what's the best way to do it, or or because I also we also want to make really really sure that people who are actually so don't people don't think that this is the latest release version. We have to make sure that people understand that if they go with a experimental features, they, they know that they're using the experimental release. Anyway, so, so I, I wanted to, to one, one way to do it would also be to provide different Docker images or different snap images or images of whatever kind. <clears throat> 
for for windows we could also just provide different binaries i, I would imagine for for windows it could probably be easiest because we do all the windows binary builds already so that would be i would imagine uh, not too complicated we'll see about that <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> I figure we could go on until two o'clock and then take a little break. Um, I might need to refill my coffee. Um, so I, I also did this presentation about curl security and, and security. We already sort of touched the subject here, but um, since we're anyway we're that few people here anyway, so I don't I don't expect us to have any more particularly bright ideas here right now. Uh, brainstorm anything. But I just brought up some discussion point that we could have had here is discuss what things to do more because it's of course an eternal discussion of how we can improve security in curl, make the code better and more safe and secure and how we can find problems faster, easier. I would say, by the way, just to interrupt myself, uh, the um, I mentioned the worst, poss possibly one of the worst security problems we've had in a long time, the one I'm working on right now that I'm going to announce in the next release. It is actually, it was introduced in the code this year. So it's actually, I think in that regard, positive news that it is actually a very, very recently added thing that someone found and we could fix. Because otherwise it's, the trend has often been that code has to be in, in, in curl for 10 years until someone actually reports a problem with it. <laughs> but I would, I would imagine that the only, the only really good way to find more security problems is for us to work on adding more fuzzing integration points into curl. Because fuzzing is pretty much the only, only really good way to find more issues unless we have some bright people who are actually reading code and, and uh, have eyes to spot the problems, but that's, that's a rare quality and it's really hard for anyone to do. I think in the case of the recent ones, all three of them are reported by the same person. And I think he's, <laughs> he's one of the guys that we can say, he has some pretty good eyes on finding, <laughs> finding problems just by reading code. That was how he how he found them. He inspected your code and, and found the issues, or was he fuzzy? Uh, well, he the, the worst one. He actually ran into a bug. He, he ran into a crash himself. Okay. So that was just a result of him analyzing the crash and figures, you know, regular debugging, and then sort of, oh wait a minute, mm -hmm. if this crash is like this, doesn't this mean that blah blah blah? And then yeah, it does. What what if? And then, oh wow, this is not good. But the other ones, I think he, I think he actually grabbed for some sensitive keywords in the code and, and looked for it, uh, for sort of you know common mistakes or common abuses. I don't want to exactly say which ones right now because I don't want to make it too easy for anyone to publicly find this out before we announce them. But when I show them, you can see that you can probably <laughs> guess which keywords he grabbed for. But still. Uh, even though, even though I can guess that that's the way he did it, it's really hard for for me to come up with a good rule based on that. You know, to how to avoid this in the future, or how mm. to have tests for this so that we don't do it again and stuff like that. Because um, the two of them were really things we should have found out <laughs> already. <laughs> we just yeah, did. That almost always the case. Yes. Like in hindsight, you say like, oh, how? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Almost always is it like that? But oh, yes, it's obvious now that now that you said it. Why? How? Yes. Yeah. So we've had a hundred public uh, security problems reported so far, and basically all of them are, are, have been like that. Oh, right. <laughs> so it just proves that you never really learn, and it never. 
there are always more. And of course, we keep changing things. So I think this, this particular time around, the, I mean, for these three ones that I'm adding, that I'm, I'm saying I'm fixing for the next release, because I wanted to say that this particular time around is also obvious that we're not that many people in the curl security team. And it's, it's sometimes a little bit lonely. <laughs> Especially when we get these really nasty bugs that, you know, it takes head scratching and thinking about them. And I've been struggling with some of them for, for well, basically a week just to try to bounce it back and forth. Is this a problem? Is this an attack? Is this a vulnerability? How can someone use this to do something nasty? And uh, yeah. yeah, but that's just life. So I am. Uh, I don't know what else there is to say about curl security. Um, I actually tried to do a talk about curl sandboxing, but I failed because I didn't want to produce a low quality talk. And there was definitely way too much resource. And the topic is kind of complicated, but maybe some kernel security mechanisms. But, but well, they would only work in the, well, the sandboxing mechanisms are kind of they are not an approach to, to fix such security issues, but they are a way to prevent the outcome of those. Right. Because, um, well, if a, remote execute quotient, if a remote code execution would happen, then the, op then the operating system might kill that process. And if they think it's better, a, a crash process is better than a malicious process. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And, and, and uh, such methods work good, exactly as you say, to sort of mitigate if the problems arise anyway, in, in spite of us trying to avoid them. And um, I think also that's uh, the, the, one of the challenges I think for me is that when, when I get a security report um, or suspected security vulnerability like that, I have to take into account that whatever, even if, if we say that sure, uh, people who are running this on Linux or any other modern, larger uh, operating systems, they're probably having, you know, they have this, uh, uh, what's it called, ASLR, when they have address, uh, randomizing the address of, of the heap and stuff like that, and the stack. So uh, sure, in those cases, it might not, might be really hard to exploit. And the, especially remote code execution is really hard to do on those systems and 64-bit systems. But then libcurl is everywhere, right? So even if we can imagine that sure, people might use that to mitigate problems on, on modern operating systems, but it's also going to run on some really old legacy operating systems without that, or some really tiny real-time operating systems that, that don't have that. So I agree that there are good ways to, to know about and to educate people about how to use for systems that have them. But from a, from a curl perspective, I also have to always uh, live with the fact that some of the some of our users or many of our users won't use them, so we still have to, I don't know, survive without them. Yeah, problem with these kernel syscodes which restrict the process. The problem is the process. It will, it will only work in the curl command line tool, not in a library. Because if a library calls such syscodes, it would it would restrict the entire process and. You, you don't know where libcurl exists. Maybe it could work if you provide some guides with which privileges and syscall libcurl requires. But again, I think they differ quite a lot. Well, of course, they require the standard syscalls like uh, the internet related ones, socket, bind, listen, but they quite differ between the curl builds, I would say. So, yeah, yeah it's it difficult. would require a long extra documentation. <laughs> Yeah. Again, a, a mistake in that documentation would mean the end of the world for some programs. So yeah, it has it's a two-sided sword. Yes. <clears throat> I'm yeah. going to, a, to do a short break because uh, it's very hot here. I go into <laughs> I'm <laughs> going to I'm going to do it. Let's take a little break. Uh, I'm going to just uh, refill my coffee and uh, okay. let's uh, have a few minutes. Coffee is important and the cool head as well. Uh, 
Oh, and Einstein is back too. Amy looks so different now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if, the, if it's the sun or the light. <laughs> Which made my appearance a bit more red. So did you see my uh, lib curl under the hood presentation? Yes. yes. I did. So did you learn anything? Or was it, it was uh, a really, really, really useful resource. And I think it's, uh, it's also a really valuable resource because more people or a great amount of people are visual learners. We already have the docs internals document, but I think a visualization of it, like you did with your presentation or, you know, the same, the same goal at least, I think it's a very valuable resource and it helped a lot actually. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, because I've been thinking about using some of the images I made for that and, and turn sort of bring back into the documentation sort of at least for maybe the everything curl book, the internals section where we can, I can mix images and text somehow and sort of uh, use more or less a, a chapter in the book, maybe as maybe inspired by the presentation or stuff like something like that. Well, you can include images in Markdown as well, but it would look a bit weird for people who are viewing Markdown as plain text. Yeah, exactly. So it would depend on how we would do it. But I, I figure since I do that already, I have it pretty good up in, in the book, it would be yeah. generated. We don't include any images in our Markdown documentation, don't we? Except for the readme with the CI built. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. That's it, I would say. Yeah, because I, I've always thought about the markdowns that we ship in the tarballs to be mostly text for people who are actually mm -hmm. getting them. Uh, so I don't want to ruin the experience for people who are reading them as text. So, yeah, so that's, that's a good thing about markdown, actually. actually. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, I, that's why I'm thinking when it comes to bundling images or using images for me with real content, I would, think, I would imagine that maybe putting them in the everything curl book would make more sense mm -hmm. because it's that one you always read as either PDF or on the web. So. The win-win situation would then be to link the chapter in the markout documentation. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, I've thought about that anyway. I, I haven't really gotten to it. I think also maybe that was, I've, yeah, that, that presentation I've been working on putting together that sort of, you know, lib curl internals presentation for a very long time. And uh, uh, it's hard to get everything as, you know, the clean description, everything. But I, f I think it worked out fairly good in the end. I also thought about what I miss in that presentation, what particular parts did not get an explanation that might still be valuable uh, to explain and that isn't very properly uh, uh, documented or explained elsewhere but i don't know if i if there was anything major i missed anything you thought about um it was <clears throat> very informative it was uh, for example the documentation like what are your minimum requirements like 32 bit ins and so on that was uh, nice to hear and the internal structures with the callbacks you have for for all different parts what i was not uh, could not fully understand is how you um if there is a common mechanism for protocol tls protocol handlers to incorporate other protocol handlers like, is the TLS protocol handler then using the HTTP protocol handler inside, or is this done differently? Mm, okay, right. You mean sort of how the handlers work together, or is is there a, like the, the this Russian doll like nested inside handlers, or is this is this that it sounded like it was not the case? It's actually not the case now. So, so yeah, I, I, that is, a, that's wow. indeed it. <laughs> so, um, right, yeah. So, so they're all basically leaves in, in the architecture. Mm -hmm. So they're all just once and back mm -hmm. and once. So they're all mm -hmm. from the HTTP, it might call the TLS one, but the TLS one will never call any of the other ones. So it will just, um, and typically, 
uh, they all, I mean, we have exposed, we have an internal API for all of them. So they, all of them could in theory use the internal APIs for whatever they want to do, but they don't know if there's a backend providing that uh, functionality or not. So, so that way it doesn't matter as long as you just use the internal API for, you know, I want to do something that is related to IDN. I want to convert my host name. You just call the convert my host name. You could do that from within the TLS code if you want to, mm -hmm. but you don't know if it's a, provided by a particular backend or if it's internal or not, because it's not. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that was, that was well explained that you have these internal services with the internal APIs and then you have different implementations. Uh, and the explanation which was dynamic and which was built in at, at build time chosen. Um, but if it comes to protocol handles, it's not clear if you make a difference between protocols which are wrappers for then the real protocol to use, so to say, like TLS, or if you have an SSH tunneling or you have a HTTP proxy connect through. It, these are like protocol handlers on a different level, so to say. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, a bit deeper OC layer separation, if that's what you mean, would have been maybe... I mean, a bit... The less protocol handler ne never carries really the request. Right. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I... I, I... It also doesn't explain much about how we deal with proxies, for example, different kind of proxies or... Uh, and as you say, tunneling, like you're doing connect through an HP proxy and stuff like that. So no. <clears throat> and we also have this complication that you can do other protocols over HTTP oh. connect uh, proxies, right? So, yeah, yeah. and we can even do two layers <laughs> of proxies. You can go through a SOX proxy mm -hmm. to an HTTP proxy. Mm -hmm. So no, that's true. I didn't actually get into much of that. But I mean, my background, maybe that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah, I am. Well, it's a, it's a valid point. It's just, um, I'll, I'll try to think about if I can explain that. The, none of that is, um, none of those particular things are very cleanly separated out so that I, I mean, some of those explanations I do, they're somewhat, I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it sounds better when I say it like that in the presentation and then what it actually looks like in the code. But when it comes to the proxy stuff, that is actually even more, you know, entangled with the code rather than a clean separated API. This is the straight. But um, yeah, I hear you. I, I'm, I'll, I'll think about it if I can clarify that for, for the future or if I convert it to um, written text. But nonetheless, the, uh, uh, the, the protocol handlers with these different functions um, and the relation to was pretty neat. So the setup, how setup connection is related with do it and then done, connected, connecting, doing this kind of stuff. The, you, know, you, you remember the graphic with the overseer where there were only two calls outside and the magic was done underwater. This was <laughs> a, a nice graphic. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I was actually pretty happy with getting that done because I think it's sort of, and I worked with that particular one a lot since, and I also, one of my, one of my things when I started to do the documentation was that I knew, I always knew, of course, that the state machine was fairly complicated and that is actually probably more complicated than it has to be. So some of the states could probably be merged into one and just be managed better, but you know, history and legacy, I, it happened. But but when I started to write about the state machine, it was then I realized what the states have really crappy names. They sort of, I cannot write, I cannot present this with these silly state names. I have to change them. So that's one, one of my pull requests from, I don't know, several months ago. It was to rename the, a bunch of the states because they were so horrible. I couldn't document them like that. I had to change them. <laughs> And then they're not perfect now either. And, and people make fun of so many do, done, did, and whatever they call. But it was even worse before that. So I'm, I'm pretty happy anyway. It's like the saying, like, when you teach someone, there are two people learning. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So yes. So, uh, one, sorry? Once 
could be interesting is like um, the overall state machine that's nice explained. And I saw like uh, several of the state names in the callbacks from the protocol handlers. So there seemed to be a, a relation. Yes. Yes. But I think the protocol handlers have their, so to say, their own internal state machine. And how does this, this is probably not one-to-one. -one. They're probably like, for example, the rate limit, limiting stuff is not implemented by the protocol handler that sits on top or? Yes. So there is like a, a subset of that, which is a state of a protocol handler. And that might be useful to document somehow like how, what a protocol handler has as states or what it has to do. I don't know yeah. if it's there. I mean, it's, it was just a question. No, uh, you're right, but, but exactly because uh, of course, each protocol that needs state, they have their own state machines. So there's a lot of distributed state machines in every protocol handler basically. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's def definitely an opportunity there really to- so yeah, You to have some, some states which are a direct action on the protocol handler. And then you have other states which are more meta states which are on top of the protocol handlers, I would imagine. Like, well, like, maybe. Of course, good good document, uh, documentation never hurts and it's always good, but um, the problem is that the states of the protocol handlers also differ between the protocols itself. Like the most well-known protocol is probably HTTP and HTTP is a stateless protocol itself. Like, you know, maybe it could, it, it, it's, yeah, HTTP 3 and HTTP 2 are a bit different, I, if I remember correctly. But I mean, the pure HTTP is a stateless protocol. And we need to use another one as a better example, maybe like FTP. It's probably the second most well known because that's not a stateless protocol. Yes, but, but also the states, the, the, since the states are internal, they don't always ma map completely to the protocol rights because it could be a state just because of the internal API. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I agree, HTTP is, is very simple in, in maybe almost all of those aspects mm -hmm. uh, because it's so easy since we don't do, it's uh, well, stateless. FTP or, or one of the SFTP is also SFTP, don't, they are complicated ones and the email oh, yeah. protocols. This is H. Yeah, so they really, they are really monster state machines. If you look at the SSH files, we have the really complicated state machines for everything. But maybe actually SMTP could be a good way to teach it because uh, to uh, explain it because you know you can't uh, really do a generic of it because different protocols have different states. But SMTP might be a good idea to start with because some people tried or already tried to send an email over Telnet. So some people might be fam familiar with the very, very, very basics of SMTP, I guess. Yeah. Because... And if, yeah. So yes, I, I, I would imagine that, that certainly um, a next level of explanation in, in this uh, area where the documentation is certainly how the different protocol handlers actually were, or uh, rather the protocols, the specific protocols are implemented really, how, how. Yeah, you could, you could shine more light on the protocol handlers structures yeah. and callbacks you have, like how do they connect to the curl engine state? Like when are they triggered in which state? Most of the time it's probably obvious because the names are the same. And then you can make an example or two how, for a specific protocol handler, the handler then operates in this. That, that's a pretty, that's a good idea. Yeah, so just sort of, this is how the handler struct looks like and how this is how yeah. it works. So, yeah. um, because for example, most of those functions have a, a done flag, which the protocol itself says when that state is done. So the protocol, each protocol has its own state machine until it's done and then it sets the done. But, but of course, I could, could go into that a little bit. It's a good idea. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see like uh, what can you from this, from all these protocols and things you do, what can you, uh, how do you abstract it in the, in the core engine, which probably tries to be agnostic of the, of the protocol details, because that is supposed to be done by the handlers. Yeah. Right? And, and how this, how this works and, and what special cases might arise. I mean, you have probably protocols which have special needs there and, and 
that might be interesting to to see just curiosity oh yeah yeah so it's exactly as you say we we try to make the core curl code to be agnostic completely agnostic and works the same way uh, independent of which protocols but of course there are that's not really yeah. true all the time there are some leakage somewhere where you know some code checks if this is this protocol do this sort of you know magically <laughs> knowing that that would be very interesting to <laughs> but we work hard to never speak about that <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, that's pretty obvious in the code somewhere when it says, oh, it's this stage to P family protocols, then do this. And then we know that's a terrible, you know, violation of layering basically internally. Yeah, but it might be interesting to, to know like, why did it happen? And what's the difficulty in, in avoiding it maybe? Yeah. yeah. Well, I find that interesting. Yes. But the other thing is like you said, like if you do something like this, you find the messy parts, which you then have a motivation to clean up a little bit, and so on. so it's good for for the curl itself as well. Oh yeah, I I think it's actually really good, and it's a really good exercise to just try to explain this in a clear mm -hmm. way. And if you can't explain it in a clear, easy way, why can't you sort of? <laughs> why why is, what's the problem here? And then sort of well, then I sort of yeah, it's it's a good exercise to to actually find areas of the code that you can fix in a way so that because things shouldn't be that hard to explain because if it's hard to explain it's probably something is probably wrong <clears throat> um it's always <clears throat> For myself, it's always like um, why I'm really in love with the good test cases, good test suits, and why I think <clears throat> for most software, the, the tests are really the most valuable stuff. Because when you have the tests, you can always rewrite the software. But if you don't have to the test, you can't change anything about your software without knowing that it still works the, the same. So <clears throat> I try to, and, and when you say like you, everyone finds, if you work for a time on a project, you, you have some messy parts. And when you revisit that for whatever reason, the test cases make, uh, enable me to, in my, to, to just rewrite certain, certain things and be reasonably sure. I mean, you break all the time stuff inadvertently, but uh, to be reasonably sure that it works still the same. So that's really the, the other value of test cases for me, at least. Oh, absolutely. I think a, a good set of tests is really invaluable. And I think we have a pretty good set of tests. So I think in most situations, I feel really confident that I'm, when I'm, you know, yanking out stuff, rewriting things and remodeling everything, I'm, I feel pretty confident that once all the tests are green again, it pretty mm -hmm. much works like it did before. So I, I think it really, it works that way. So I, I feel, I agree with you completely that it's, it gives you confidence uh, that you can do things without worrying too much because you know that you will get that on your, someone will hit you over the head as long as you're doing it wrong. And when it's good, it's good. And then we're good to go. Yeah, I mean, every one of us probably has at some point in his career gotten a piece of software written by some guys who is no longer in the company and you have a bug report on it and there are no test cases and you say like hmm dare i i try to make the minimal fix here because i don't know what else i can all break because he says no way to check this exactly so it's limiting creativity and freedom and um yeah and there's i think not enough emphasis on that part in like the public speaking about this right no but i but i agree having have a good and that's also why i wanted i want us to sort of continuously add tests in areas where we are weak with tests because as you say it's hard to fix things in areas that aren't tested properly because you don't know exactly what you're breaking when you fix things if you don't test it good enough yeah and testing manually is just boring and stupid yeah and uh, 
and you just get reminded every time that when you do that manually, you just happen to run the same things all the time with my narrow mindset. So sort of, yeah, I test everything that I thought about, which happens to be just a little fraction of all the test cases really, or whatever anyone else would think about. I don't need to run those tests because that thing I never changed, right? <laughs> so stuff like that, or, or you know, subconsciously, you know that uh, you go, don't go there. So we don't go there. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> okay, on to I um I liked your Rust talk there, St Stefan. I, I learned I learned Rust stuff. I I mean I, I worked with the hyper things, but I don't know Rust at all. So I I, I think I thought it was uh, educational to get some Rust C style uh, introduction. Nice to hear. Yeah, I tried to <clears throat> to summarize the, the experience of the last uh, three, three, two and a half months, three months um, in this project. Like I didn't know really Rust before. I had read something about it and so on, but now I'm um, I, I'm dipping my toes into it, so to say. Like I'm I'm making pro proposals for changes in the Crustles part, so in the in the C API. So. I try to write a little bit Rust code, and then Jacob says, "Like, oh my God, no, this." Be good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have discussions about this, and some change, some pull requests make it through. So, um, yeah, that's that's like Rust Rust on the surface. But I'm I'm coming in this project. My role is really to come with the application point of view, to say like uh, the application needs this and that feature, which is not there. Um, and we need to edit, and uh, maybe it has. Most often, it's edited in, in, in Crustles, and sometimes it's uh, features which are missing in the Russells in the library itself, because of course they also have a history. They come more from the client side. They come from the Mozilla side uh, uh, view of things, so they have everything which a client needs, but for a server has needs some more, and, and there are discussions about that. And um, yeah, the application, if you put it in an application like an Apache server, there are certain, certain things, how they work and certain restrictions, which must, might be, must be observed. And uh, the Jacob and, and the Russell's guys, they often say like, why do we need that? <laughs> and that's my part to say like, yes, but we, we do need that. <laughs> I have to somehow I have to make it work, and and this is this this bridge building which I try to summarize in the presentation, uh, and and like that is to be expected. Uh, when you try to integrate Rust components into CE applications, you have to build this bridge, uh, because most Rust components do not have it, as far as I know, right? And they have not really thought about it. Uh, they live in the, the Rust world, which is fine, of course, but uh, if you bring this together, they, they have to, and the bridge has, after this, after we have done this and have the experiences, the idea is that this bridge crosses, gets folded back into the Rust, Russell's code. And I'm curious, like, how that will work in the long run when Rust projects really make a public C API and, and some ABI compatibility and, and releases for that and fixes for that and so on, now, how that will all work out. But that's in the future. Now, now we uh, make the, the stuff itself running and not only running, but running well. And I think that looks quite good so far. Um, and we come with a performance and, and in certain functions, uh, uh, compatible uh, implementation to the open SSL stuff we have in the server. So for people who are tired of open SSL security releases, maybe this is an, a route how they can, how can they, they can run their servers and have a better feeling about the, at least this part. Yeah, I general wanted, wanted to say something to the talk from you. I liked it was a good talk for both worlds, like for C devs and also for uh, for us developers who want to want to make a C API available. So it was a valuable resource for both sides. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the talk. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, it was fun to, to putting this together. And of course, you start to think about like, how do I explain certain things and what is really there to, to teach and so on. Like, like you said, like you call, call internals by making it, you, you reflect and, and do some, some things. And um, I don't know how it is working in the core project. Then you said like you you a little bit more stay on the just the you get the C API from from Jacob more or less and then use that incorporate that in, in the core, but you don't go on in, in into this layer really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I think because uh, I've, you've had a much more hands on since you're you're actually working on this and in in the curl case this is Jacob's work more than mine. So J Jacob has worked on both the curl side and the crustal side. So he has been dipping his toes in both waters. So I think he has done that work, that, that the, the work you're doing with crustals, Jacob has done. So he, for curl side, I guess he had an easier job because then he, he was on both sides himself. <laughs> he built the bridge himself and sort of managed it. So I think in that regard, it was probably easier. So I haven't actually monitored how that worked out and and since he also did that before he started yours so I, I think maybe that he got that going so he had that basics going and then he started with your uh, sort of approach mm -hmm. yeah uh, but f so from my from my perspective it seemed to be working really well but but i also think that i didn't see it the first time until it was fairly well <laughs> working already so i thought he had he he had been working in his chambers for a while by the time he made his first pull request and by that time it looked pretty good already uh -huh. yeah, he's a smart guy definitely so uh, i've been i've been more involved with hyper this hyper has the exact same uh, sort of approach or uh, issues or whatever we should say i mean that they have an, a rust library and they have a c api and we're using the c api and they uh, so that exists already that didn't exist okay so when i asked about them the first time they said yeah we're planning on having one <laughs> okay so they are right this then the the, the c hyper so to say yes yeah. mm -hmm. so they they have pretty much the exact same uh, situation that they're creating a C API for the Rust library. And um, also, I, I think they have a similar situation in that they're, they have an implementation that they're trying to, you know, have standardized and strict, sort of the, the way it's supposed to be. But, but that's not the way we want to have it, right? We want to have it so that it actually works in the real world. We don't, I don't, we don't really care about correct if it doesn't work in the real world, you know, that's, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is right, reality or the map. Uh, I prefer the reality actually. <laughs> so we adjust the map after reality. So that's, you know, so things, um, so I've had a little bit of a struggle there to make sure that um, we can do things the way we've always done them in curl for legacy reasons even if someone could say that well maybe this isn't the right way to do it but no it might not be but it's it's the way it actually happens out there in, in the real world so we need to care about that and it needs to work like that so i've been uh, we've been doing that a little bit back and forth and otherwise i think i more a lot of my issues have been that uh we've gone gone with some selections in curl how to do things http wise and they have gone gone another way for example just a silly little thing that we fixed the other day that we're when you can tell curl to send chunked encoded data when you know when you send a post or put and you use chunk encoding in the actual request body easy pc sort of but of course they went with uppercase hexadecimal and curl goes with lowercase hexadecimal, which of course is, it doesn't matter. But if you have a test case that compares the actual, actual data you send, exactly what bytes we send and just verifies, did we send the right data? It didn't send the right data because they have sent it in uppercase hex and we send it in lowercase hex. So of course it introduces a challenge for the test suite. So how do we compare the data when we, one of them sends uppercase hex and one of them sends lowercase hex stuff. And we have more cases like that. Uh, for example, when we, when we get data from an HTTP server like Apache, we, in, in curl, we, we can deal with either 
you know, carriage return line feed or just line feeds end of lines. We don't need, we don't even care. We don't have to have the carriage return yeah. it's because uh, some servers just don't send it. So we don't care about it. But when we receive it, we pass on this, the actual line endings to the client. We just pass it through because, you know, why convert it? It's there on the wire. We just read the bytes and we pass it on. But that's not how it works in, in, in Hyper. In Hyper, we, we don't get the actual byte over the wires. We get uh, just header data pairs. And then we have to make up the line endings <laughs> when we pass it on to the client. And then we sort of have to make, was it carriage return line feed or just line feed? So we always have to pass on carriage return line feed. But that makes it also hard to do test cases because we have test cases that use a mix or either or, but now the test cases don't actually always binary match because we do it differently. So th th that's kind of icky stuff I've worked with. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So now we actually have to, the, the test suite detects if it's running hyper or the built-in HTTP. And if it runs hyper, it actually automatically converts all HTTP headers to the carriage return line feed headers so that it can compare them binary wise. Okay. So, that, yeah. mm -hmm. so, so the test suite actually knows about those two different sets. Huh. Lots of details, yes. Yeah, there are some other sort of details like that because you have to make some selection when you weigh, make your API or how to do HTTP. Maybe, maybe we don't always agree that this is the way. For example, they, uh, they also didn't expose the, the reason in HTTP responses, the text, you know, HTTP 200, 1.1, uh, 200, okay, that little okay text, they didn't expose that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, in HTTP 2, it doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean HTTP three either. So you know, and it doesn't mean anything to anyone because it's mm. just text. But again, <laughs> we pass that through, and we have some test cases that actually verifies mm. that we can read it and so on. So we had to stuff like that, legacy stuff that we've done that we uh, that I more or less made them do as well, <laughs> so that we can, so that curl can maintain functionality exactly as it did before, even when we use Hyper. Yeah, we had some discussions about our application context, like what you have in OpenSSL. You have this <clears throat> void pointer, like application data, which you can ins install. Uh, and, and in all callbacks, you can either you get it or you can retrieve it. So the application can get its context. Right. That was there in Russell's. So there were discussions like how to add this. And the Rust people were like, oh no, this has no place in Rust really because it's not Rust stylish thingy, so to say. And so Jacob said like, oh, we'll make a thread local for this. And I said like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> thread local. But, it, uh, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. And I said like, but if you do it, uh, uh, it needs to be re-entered. Why does it need to be re-entered? I said like, <laughs> You have a big server, and I mean, if you make a call back into the server code, all thing or all possible things might happen because I mean, the, the the one module makes a lookup in the cache, and that cache uses also a TLS connection, maybe also using Russell's for something else, and you will need reentrance here. Okay, so so this kind of things to like how how it is in the real world and and. Uh, how they thought it would all work yeah yeah it's interesting yeah i mean it's 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 like yeah they're all a nice guy and it's very friendly and, and cooperative to to work together so uh, we don't get this wrong but it's like they came from one place and we come from another and and it's not only bridge building between c and rust but also between different views on how this stuff is used oh yeah i i think actually a lot of that bridge building is is uh... It's not, it's not between the different languages, but between different sort of groups or mindsets or something, because you, you build server software, I build library software, and Rust hasn't really been used. They, that's mostly been an application language, and they have such an application authoring mindset. So it's, I think that's, those are also very important bridges, not only be, yeah. between languages. Yeah. 
Yeah, that reflects also like uh, you can build a library with Rust, but if you just do it like that and you want to link two libraries, you get the duplicate symbols. <laughs> All the components are right. each library, and um, and it's also a question for the future. If like you have a you have a, a security fix in one of the Rust components, how do you get this all deployed out in the uh, how many libraries there will be where this all is statically linked in, so to say? Yes. Yeah. So there are several things to to sort out. I mean, <clears throat> this also shows the the flexibility of the infrastructure we have on the on the Linux and C side, and the ABI compatibility and, and the shared libraries and so on. And, and that when uh, glibc uh, does a fix, uh, you don't have to recompile all applications uh, again to, to deploy it somewhere. And um, this is all not there yet. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's probably because, uh, yeah, that's. Mm. Yeah, I... <sighs> what, something wrong? Uh... Test, hello? Oh, great. I think it works now. Yeah, Rust has in general a problem of not being, well, C, C and Unix, they, they were created equally. They were created by the same company. So uh, they have uh, some influence on each other, like in general, the static and dynamic, the possibility of linking dynamically with applications is like um, for C libraries, that's like a very normal thing on Unix, but it's not with Rust probably because Rust yeah, it's, it's maybe a bit hard to explain. It's probably not impossible, but it's not the way how it works right now. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it, it comes... Think for security, for, and for security reasons, dynamic linking is for libraries like curl very important. Or TLS libraries in general, they are dynamic linking is a must. Static linking, TLS libraries is a no-go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they come from, from another corner there, definitely. And um, bundling all together. And, and th that comes, of course, that from their history, how they were invented and where they were first used in, in, uh, and um, that designed it. But if we go into bringing Rust into, uh, into the OS slash C world, there are some, as you said, like some requirements which, which need to be addressed. But this is, I mean, you, we can only find it out by doing it. Uh, it will not just come into existence. Uh, absolutely. And, and not only finding out. I mean, you, we have to, they have to really put this, uh, they want to, they need to go there to, to get the motivation to fix it too. So, right. So it won't happen un until they actually try to do it and then sort of just work through it and figure out the way how, how it should be done and then get, get it done. So. I think this is the only way to make it actually happen for, for the Rust and for us to use Rust. So it's, it just has to be this. And I think, I mean, these two projects, we, we get to be a bit early on this. So we, we get to see more of this. So hopefully a lot of these things will be worked out and for the future, it'll be easier and easier. So we'll see if we get more rusty things going forward. I have that as a question here. Should we, is there more things we should replace with Rust modules in curl? In curl. In curl. I think right now it's a more of a matter of, uh, well, we could replace other things in curl with Rust modules, but I don't think we have other Rust modules to really select from, uh, I, not to my knowledge. So yeah, sure. But then we have to rewrite a lot of curl stuff in Rust suddenly. That's a lot of work. And that's not a job for me. <laughs> but at least we have the advantage that, that curl is in C and C is, all, is always the lowest common denominator for cross-language interaction. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it, it really... Like with bridge building, you have to make an API to use. You cannot just 
take some functions in in a library like curl or an application like apache and, and rewrite it in another in, in rust so you have to have some internal it doesn't have to be a public api but it doesn't you have to have some sort of api internally where this bridge happens yes and um so it, it makes more sense to to select a certain functional component to replace with a new implementation like what's happening and then you can't write half the curl core in rust that will not work no exactly yeah. you have to sort of figure out a good portion this like this protocol maybe or this particular feature and have that written but you, you're, you're right so you have to have that component in rust and then or whatever language and then you would have to have that uh, bridge code and then you would have to re figure out the the internals to, so, because we also don't want to switch to that completely so we would have, need to have the built-in option as well because we're going Is there to rust code for, for name resolving uh, no, but but the name resolving is a well that would could possibly be a, an interesting thing. But name resolving in general, we we just do a thread and then do the normal get other info okay. call. So it's not really curl code anyway. It's, it's, uh, so I would say that's not the ideal thing to replace. Possibly it would be to get a, a DNS lookup library complete, like is the CA REST, but, but, in, mm -hmm. but that's also a huge work and there's no standard API there either. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah. and replacing and uh, name resolving in anything, it's a monstrous task. That's also why- You know more about this than any of us probably. Yeah, but, uh, and, and I know it's, it's been done and, and tried in many, many places, it's, you know, Try to replace get other info with whatever and whatever effort you put into it. It's it's a it's a job that you don't easily do. And I know Mozilla gave up on that as well. So it, you know it's not <laughs> even if you throw a lot of manpower on it, it's it's really hard because you want that to work exactly as get other info on you know on your primary platforms. And it's really a lot of old legacy code. How do you resolve a name? It's not only DNS. You know, it's all the other DNS is easy. It's all the other ways how you resolve a name, uh, files okay. and all the other uh, weirdo things. And those are the ones that are tricky. So as long as you can stick, that's why CARES works really good if, as long as you stick to DNS. But uh, the, that's only 95% of all the cases. Then the other 5%, that's where the problem starts. And, that's, and other systems like Windows and other that have peculiar behavior on, and, outside of outside of dns so i would yeah. say i would say go going with that for the rust that you that's the challenge for any uh, library that tries to resolve host names yeah i was thinking like like uh, to, to to use more memory safe code is of course most interesting where you have data coming from the outside untrusted data yes so yeah <laughs> Probably bringing the most security benefits and uh, stuff that you need to then parse a lot of uh, parsing. I mean, if you could re replace parsing, C parsing with Rust parsing, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe your um, file caching components. Mm. Yeah, caching. Cache him like cookies, maybe. Yeah, cookies and HD, HSTS and HSTS, uh, old service. service. Yeah. These kind of things. Yes, maybe. But that's a hard sell to, to get that, for example, sponsored because there's no. <sighs> No immediate argument like you about the threat level there. No, you're right. Um, I mean, in the Apache server, TLS is one thing, and there are many, many other modules. And I, I also think that the, the core protocol handlers are not being replaced that easily. And um, 
from my experience with the HTTP2 implementation in Apache to, to have that like with something hyper like components, I don't see that either really. Um, is it too ingrained or, or, or is it? Yeah, I mean, we have, <clears throat> if, if the ng HTTP2 library, the quality would be bad that might be a candidate like the the core h2 engine to replace that with something then we'll say right but the lib ng h2 is rock solid i mean <laughs> yeah. uh, there are no really security issues that i have seen like they have bugs of course but I, there's no real issue with that library so i don't see the pressing need to do that that could be replaced with something else of course but um, most of the work in, in mod H2 is really then the blue code to bring this uh, H2 processing model into the server. Like in a server which was designed for H1. Right. Where you have one request per connection and all these assumptions which are ingrained into it, like the, I don't know how, 25 year old or 26, I'm, I'm, I don't have the number how old it is. But. That was the, the challenge on the, it is the challenge and there the bugs are continue to be found. I must say. <laughs> yeah, but it, I, I think it's roughly the same in curl. I mean, the, the step from going to one connection, one request per connection to having many transfers per connection, that's still the same. That's still the problematic thing for H2. Um, I, it might get a little bit easier with H3, but only because the APIs are slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, the call internal APIs. Mm. You know, and even the H3 libraries, because they have to, because then they own, the, they set up the connection differently. So, and the, 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 um, the multiplexing is done outside of H3. So we could, if we can just use H3, it can sort of hide it a little bit better. I think, okay. but I, but I, in reality, I think the problem is there this, the same thing that reading from a connection, you get data for more than one transfer and that's complicated because as, as exactly as you said about Apache, we did curl the same way. So the API is, is actually transfer related and originally one transfer had one connection. If you read from the connection, you got data for that transfer. Now you can get data from, for any number of transfers and it, complicates matters so i think that haunts us even too and i mean until today as well so we i mean we fix h2 problems oh uh, yeah in this coming release i think we have two or three bug fixes again in h2 so it's yeah it keeps keeps popping up i think it's there and i think it's solid and then someone reports a really terrible bug and so how how can it remain yeah. like this today yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, it has, it has stabilized, but there's still now and again some things which are like, oops. And with H3 for Apache, that's also a question which pops up now and again. <clears throat> yes, a lot of work from the H2 uh, stuff can also, would also apply there. Uh, but there's also several new things like you said, like uh, you have a new UDP socket and, and things are handled differently. And then if you really want to do proper H3, you have to <clears throat> handle connection IDs differently from sockets. Yes. And no, yes. The, the server is really not prepared for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's complicated also since then. Um, also, you have to have really high. Uh, High resolution timers suddenly that you didn't have to before, because now now you need to deal with all the basically the socket timeouts that the kernel does for TCP. You now have to do that yourself. Ah, okay. Since since you know just reading TCP from a socket, you know the kernel does a lot of you know internals for all the congestion control and back and forth and everything. So you didn't have to care. Now you have to have have really high resolution timers so that you can call it again when it has to resend and hold off and stuff like that. So it's, it's def definitely adds a lot of low level logic into your code that previously you didn't have to care about because you just read data from a socket and sort of that was the transition. Someone else dealt with all those little 
tiny details. Now all those details are, are yours to take care of. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, then maybe not yours, but they might, might be handled by the API, but still, you know, it'll still say things like, wait for a few hundred nanoseconds, then call me again. You wouldn't yeah, do that yeah. with TCP. <laughs> Yeah, but for the socket I/O, the, the low socket I/O, TCP I/O, we have different modules as well, depending on platform. Right. And um, so you would have to have to break that abstraction to open it up. That's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not eager to do that. Right. Now it's uh, it's an interesting challenge. No, no doubt. No, I think it would be, if someone would force me to work on that, I think I would do it as a separate process. I mean, as part of the server, but in a separate process, which then talks H2 to the main server. Oh, right, yeah. So you have a controlled environment where this all runs in and then can don't have to break all the abstractions and, and tear it, everything up. Something like that. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So then I hope you get the funding through for continuing with the hyper stuff in curl. Yes, I hope so too. So I'm, I'm expecting it to arrive at uh, some point. Um, I know that there's discussion going on exactly how it will happen, but it's not public. So I'm not going to say it here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I, I, I think it would be fun to see a future where we can actually see what someone build curl with hyper and Russell's as backends and see them working the same way as it would work with any other mature TLS library and the, the built-in HTTP. So that, I think that's a fun, a fun future to, to work with. I was, uh, the, the, one of the interesting challenges with, with switching on hyper is also that hyper is such a low level HTTP library. So I have a lot of HTTP in curl anyway, <laughs> since HTTP is such a wide protocol, right? It does so much. So all the, you know, authentications and so many different layers. And like, as we mentioned already, all service and HSTS, and so much of that stuff is handled, I would say sort of outside of what's being transferred over the wire. While Hyper, for example, is mostly transfer over the wire library. So it's mostly deals with that. So it introduced an interesting, well, that also made it slightly easier for me. So it just How's the H2 handling of Hyper? Do they have their own whole state machine in, in, in Hyper? Yes. They, yes, so they do that very transparently. So it, so it works very the same way. So I don't need to know much about H2 or H1 for, mm -hmm. for that to work. So it, it works really nice. Uh, there, I know they're working on H3, so I'm, that, I'm, I'm a little bit curious how they're going to solve that because that is going to be different anyway, since I can't just switch to H3 from the other ones since it's using a different connection and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting. And it also, it'll also be interesting because it's, I have to, you know, as I showed you in that presentation, have an HTTP3 API internally and an HTTP one. The HTTP one now does one and two, and I have a separate one for HTTP three. So if I suddenly introduce HTTP three through Hyper, I have a sort of, I don't know how to juggle that. It'll be an interesting, I don't know. I have to maybe rethink something internally. Is there HTTP three support even planned in Hyper? I thought it's one and two only. No, they have that. Uh, I think they already have some work on it. And I, I know huh. that they want to support it. So I think it's in their roadmap. So I. I, I presume that it will come one day. So yeah, probably it makes no sense stopping at two. I guess exactly. And then so that what and when they do and when they have something that they think work, then I have to decide how to actually. Yeah, and then I have to, of course, 
understand how it works in hyper and then i need to under, uh, understand how we can use that in curl if we can use it the same way as we use hyper now or if we need to do something else it, de it depends on a lot of specifics we'll see i don't think it we don't need to sort of worry about that now we'll take that later when it happens And no, Jim has arrived to talk about his presentation about curl performance or application profiling. I think it was a fun talk to see him uh, just do some basic profile stuff on curl. I've been thinking about how to do basic performance testing as part of our test suites. So to make sure to, I sometimes get asked people how, how I do performance testing so how we notice when I do some when we do something wrong that makes it perform bad but but we don't so we don't notice that and I've been thinking about how to do that in a test suite or you know run some basic performance tests get some numbers and maybe get some graphs over time or detect when we do something terribly bad that makes it perform worse but that's a really challenging task so I haven't I, I keep thinking about it, <laughs> postponing it. The, I, the, the uh, blog from Microsoft about their quick implementation. I don't know if you have read that. I, I think I did, yeah. They did uh, performance measurements as part of their pull request analysis as well. Yes, yeah. Which, that uh, pull requests did not, neg at least not negatively impact their performance. Yeah, I've seen that. And, and that's sort of one of my sort of inspirations. Yeah, I would like to have that too. But I mean, it's really hard to get that. So that you need to some stable benchmarks running on public CI servers. I bet the benchmarks will go up and down depending on. So, I mean, you have to some, I don't know exactly how to do that. You have to have some solid machines that are reliable and you can run the tests, I don't know, X number of times and the one in the middle will be fairly stable. Uh, I don't know uh, exactly. There are some challenges with doing that and I would like to have that, but I haven't really been. Yeah, they must have had dedicated CI machines for that. Yeah, pro I, I hear Microsoft ha has a few machines. <laughs> Maybe they could spare one. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, I don't have anyone to spare. <laughs> And even if I had, I think I, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a task to get it up. But I, it would be really good. And and, it, and I think and another sort of just that is this pretty much in the same spirit is I would like to have, I would like to write a, just a performance test to see how fast can curl do something. You know, I have people sometimes ask me how many requests per second can you do with curl. I have no idea. I have never, I never even tried. <laughs> I never even checked how many you can do per, how do, how do you mean how many per second? It depends on so many factors, but, but it doesn't matter. I would like to have perhaps that also sort of as a benchmark test. If we can do X number of requests per second now, we should be able to do the same number of requests per second in a year, right? Or at, yeah. least, or at least, or or have a good motivation why we can. I think, or, yeah. I think for C applications, it's in general very crucial to do some benchmarks because you have the lack of a very complex and optimized standard library, which other languages do, where you know they have standardized, very good, well-tested algorithms. You don't have this in C. So it's very crucial for C applications to offer some benchmarks. And I think that's a good thing we should do maybe in future. And yeah, you know right. where we can improve. If you see which functions takes that amount of time and then, and then you see oh, this function has three loops, but we can eliminate them and put them all into one. And also, I think I mm -hmm. think by just trying to make it as, I mean, just check how, how fast, uh, on a specific hardware, how fast can you actually do, uh, how many requests per second can you do right now? That's actually a good way to say, oh, you could only do this many, how come? And then check that out and maybe we could fix this and then get it a little bit faster. Because if we never even check, of course, we don't have the motivation to even fix mm -hmm. the little things that we might be able to fix because we didn't really check for it. So, so I think, yeah, I think that would be a good thing. But yeah. I've <laughs> I've been thinking that for a long time. It's still also, it's, it's uh, one of these things we should have, we should do, someone should. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, you need a predictable setup, otherwise it's no no value. Exactly. So um, this. Yeah, transfers per second is a an obvious measurement, but it's very tricky and uh, influenced by many things. Um, oh, 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 yeah, but but it, the the good thing I, with having your own stable set then would be that you would compare the same thing. Yeah. It doesn't really matter then if you say, okay, this large response or whatever, it doesn't matter as long as it would be the same. So you have that delta comparison rather than comparing anything else. Because as you say, there are so many different factors. Number of host names, how fast is the network? How fast can you store things? How big is the responses? How big is, are the requests? How many different connections do you use? Blah, blah, blah. And then again, of course, uh, I don't want, sometimes I also, people mention tools like H2 load and compares that to curl. And of course you can do, using a load testing tool, you can do a lot of requests. I don't ever expect curl to compare against load test no, tools no, no. because curl is not a load test tool. It does transfers, it doesn't load test. Yeah, it's to load. I use H load in my in my tests, of course, because it's nice for making these load tests. I use for functional tests. I use curl mostly. Um, H to load. I mean, it, it makes a request, and it, it all the traffic comes back. It it throws away immediately. I mean, that's that's a huge difference, of course. And then it has also its limitations. If a connection, if the server closes the connection uh, on from his side, then it gives up on this connection. It does not do any retrying on this connection, and so on and so on. Yeah. So it, it, but for the job, it's designed. It's it's working well and nice. And I do it to. I I always want to have a feeling, like you said, like. What is achievable? How does it compare to our OpenSSL implementation? At least on my machine, is it comparable? That's that's what I want to know. If I see something obviously different, um, I can see like, can we address this? Is there something which can we can be done better? This is what I like. But it's it's that that doesn't say anything beside my machine. There's really no no. Um, I, I can't guarantee any anything on another installation. It's too different, too many, too many factors. Yeah. <clears throat> A good thing about benchmarks would be that we could finally add even more graphs. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. We can't have enough. We can't what, do we, enough. what do you mean, finally? You mean we can continue? We can, we, can, we can continue, yes. <laughs> Continuing is a good word, but the road never ends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a very good, that's a best point so far. Best point, yes, best point. You say it. Make a benchmark on Daniel's local machine. <laughs> okay. Who says just Daniel's? Yeah, we should all, we should all have them. Yeah, you can make one graph for Daniel's machine and one for Emil's machine and one for James' machine. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I think we've been doing this for two hours. We might want to round this off soon. Do we have any other questions? Anyone else who's here who hasn't talked? Anyone has any questions or discussion points or anything? Feel free to fire away something. <clears throat> um. Thank you for recording the presentations. I really liked it. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, I think having these pre-recorded talks is a decent way to do this uh, online only. Since then we don't have to do all the presentations live or having to attend at the same time. We can just watch them in our own time. Hopefully we don't have to do this next year. Hopefully we can do it in person. Mm -hmm. I hope, or I, my thinking is that um, I would go back to the 2020 plan and do it in Berlin in 2022, but we'll see. Maybe even contact the same place as we had. <laughs> <laughs> we can then reuse most of the 
Arts and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we just replay 2020 in 2020. Minimal, minimal work for maximum profit. <laughs> Reset. <laughs> exactly. We just we just skip forward two years. Yeah. This the the last two years did not happen. <laughs> Something like that. All right, but then I think we're going to just uh, be happy with this. It was fun talking to you. Um, good to see you. Uh, hope we'll see you in Berlin in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> and see you in IRC and on GitHub and everywhere, of course. Yeah, it's always good to see someone in faces like we did today. It is, it is. This was fun. Uh, so uh, have a good sure. day out there in your in the sun, Emil. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Have Bye, a good everyone. day in the snow in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Bye, Those everyone. also, but sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> but can get annoying quickly. Yeah, but we actually have eight degrees. I think today, seven degrees. Yeah, I will have this. I will have this tomorrow again. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Bye. Bye thanks a lot.